In this Dharma ending age, the faculties of sentient beings are quite poor. Lama Tsongkhapa summarized all the Dharma teachings into the three principal aspects of the path. We should make the three principal aspects of the path the core of our practice. Otherwise, our study and practice will progress very slowly. I have also repeatedly emphasized that renunciation and buddhacitta are the foundation of all Buddhist schools, including the Pure Land School, Chan School and Vajrayana School. Why do we emphasize it repeatedly? It's because they are essential for practitioners. Without renunciation and buddhacitta, even if one practices the most advanced dharma, it's futile. Only with renunciation and buddhacitta can one formally start to learn and practice Mahayana Buddhism. Patrul Rinpoche said, Without renunciation and buddhacitta, even if one practices the great perfection in retreat for nine years, they cannot sow the seeds of liberation. They cannot even sow the seeds of liberation. This compels us to reflect. Their practice of the great perfection spans not just one or two years, but nine years. Their method of practice is not intermittent, but involves blocking walls with mud, declining visitors, and cutting off all contact. However, due to the lack of renunciation and buddhacitta, they cannot sow the seeds of liberation. This serves as a warning to us. Without renunciation and buddhacitta, one may end up in such a situation where even after nine years of practicing the great perfection, they cannot sow the seeds of liberation. Therefore, renunciation and buddhacitta are extremely important for any practitioner. Due to lacking this knowledge and only knowing the benefits of esoteric and Chan Buddhism, many people crave lofty goals and dream about achieving enlightenment without preliminary practices. They busily seek empowerments, study profound sutras like the Surangama Sutra or Lotus Sutra at home, and happily practice these advanced Dharma yet see little progress in the end. These problems cannot be blamed on the Dharma, but on their weak foundation. Therefore, those who wish to study Mahayana Buddhism must have renunciation and buddhacitta, which are the foundation of all exoteric and esoteric teachings of Mahayana Buddhism and the indispensable prerequisite of all Dharma practices. All esoteric teachings emphasize renunciation and buddhacitta greatly. For example, when practicing at the generation stage, without the view of emptiness and compassion, even if one visualizes the deity clearly, it's meaningless. Similarly, as stated in the scriptures, without renunciation and buddhacitta, even if one recites billions of deity mantras, it's not considered remarkable. Therefore, the key to all Dharma practices is renunciation and buddhacitta. Currently, many lay practitioners lack qualified renunciation and buddhacitta and don't understand their importance. They blindly chant various deity rituals. Here, I have to remind you that this can only help you build a karmic connection with the deity, but it's not very meaningful. The exoteric and esoteric schools of Buddhism share the same essence. Everything is determined by the intention. 
In opening the gate to cultivating the mind, it is taught that if a person practices solely for the perfection of this lifetime, such as wealth, peace, safety, health, fame, and fortune, through activities like releasing animals, making offerings to the Sangha and Buddha, and doing good deeds, then even if they achieve their wishes in this life, they are still trapped in samsara. If their wishes are not fulfilled due to karma from past lives, these good deeds will not generate any results that can lead them to liberation. Instead, they will only receive some karmic rewards in the next life. This is because they are only concerned with their own happiness and well-being in the present life without considering liberation or generating bodhicitta to benefit sentient beings. Since their intentions are so clear, how can their good deeds lead to liberation? A cause yields a corresponding result. Hence, it is totally impossible. In the Buddhist scriptures, there is a metaphor. A person, driven by hunger, is struggling on the brink of life and death. If he doesn't eat immediately, he will die in half an hour. At this moment, if you let him go to the king's treasury to get something, what should he choose first? Absolutely food because although the treasures of gold, silver and jewels in the treasury are precious, they cannot alleviate his hunger. Expensive gold, silver and jewels are useless to him at that time. Similarly, the Pure Land School, Chan School and Vajrayana School, although very precious, are too advanced for those without a foundation. For us, the most urgent thing is to cultivate renunciation and bodhicitta. Moreover, there is another metaphor. In ancient times, many cities in both the east and the west were surrounded by walls. To enter the city, one had to pass through the city gate. If a city only had one gate and no other way to enter, then everyone who wished to enter the city had to pass through this gate. Inside the city, there were many houses, and once you entered the city, you could go to any house you wished. However, if you didn't pass through the gate, you could only stay outside the city and would never be able to enter it. This metaphor illustrates that renunciation and bodhicitta are the only gateways to enter the path to liberation and the bodhisattva path. Once your renunciation and bodhicitta arise, you can freely choose what practice to engage in. However, before your renunciation and bodhicitta arise, Attempting to practice these teachings would be like a mantis trying to stop a carriage with its arms. It is really a silly act beyond one's capacity. Renunciation Therefore, now we don't need to rush to practice advanced teachings. Instead, we should first generate a firm and unwavering renunciation. So, what are the criteria for renunciation? There are several aspects of cultivating renunciation, including the infallible law of cause and effect, the rarity of a precious human life, the impermanence of life, and the suffering of samsara. Through study, first, we should firmly believe in the law of cause and effect and the existence of cyclic existence without any doubts. This is not easy. There should be no doubts. Second, we should deeply understand the rarity of the precious human life with the eight freedoms and ten advantages. 
we should deeply experience the three types of suffering in samsara. We should bear the impermanence of life and mind. It's very important to learn and practice these four aspects, which must be continually practiced for renunciation to arise. It's not enough to briefly learn about them. Occasional renunciation is unstable and easily fades away. You should diligently engage in these four preliminary practices and not take them lightly. The cultivation of renunciation is not that simple. Some people, after generating a bit of renunciation, rush to become monastics, seeking liberation. They engage in meditation every day, eagerly aspiring to attain enlightenment. In the first couple of years after ordination, they might engage in Buddhist practices such as chanting the Buddha's names, practicing meditation, and studying the Dharma. However, as time passes, they start to work like laborers, busy with temple construction, or like farmers and doorkeepers. Moreover, some are busy performing Buddhist rituals to earn money. This phenomenon is quite common in the Buddhist community. Such people are the majority rather than the minority. After three to five years of monastic life, they no longer practice or teach the Dharma to lay people. The slight renunciation they have previously cultivated gradually fades away and almost disappears. Then, they start to engage in worldly activities and settle into temple life. They hang out with those who lack renunciation, not studying the Dharma and not following good spiritual teachers. They wear the monastic's robes but ruin the reputation of the three jewels. They are creating the cause for falling into hell. Therefore, when we have the opportunity to learn the path to liberation and generate a bit of renunciation, we should strike while the iron is hot, striving to let go of all attachment and quickly engaging in actual practice with the monastic community to strengthen our renunciation. The course on the path to liberation includes meditating on impurity, Multiplicity, the three types of suffering, impermanence and non-self. Moreover, there is the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness, mindfulness of the body, feelings, mind and phenomena. When the Buddha entered into Nirvana, he said, the four foundations of mindfulness are the foundation of our liberation. The arising of renunciation is just the first step. If we don't strike while the iron is hot and practice the path to liberation, our renunciation will fade away. Therefore, it's important to promptly strengthen our renunciation. Not to mention renunciation, even one's five precepts and ten virtuous actions can decline. Some people have been practicing the ten virtuous actions for thousands of lifetimes and have formed strong karmic habits of engaging in virtuous actions. Life after life, they like giving and therefore enjoy blessings in the human and heavenly realms. However, if they don't encounter the path to liberation and the authentic Dharma, after several kalpas, when there are no Buddha, no Dharma, and no qualified spiritual teachers, due to being surrounded by evil people and negative conditions, their virtuous intentions will gradually diminish. 
They will no longer practice the ten virtuous actions, and their accumulated merits will gradually be exhausted. After several culpas, their virtuous intentions will completely fade away. They will become evil people and eventually fall into the three lower realms. Therefore, if you haven't liberated from samsara, no matter how well you practice the ten virtuous actions, you will completely decline after several kalpas. If you stay in the higher realms for a period, you have to stay in the three lower realms for an equivalent duration. This is samsara. It operates on the principle of balance. Those who don't aspire to transcend samsara are ignorant. No matter how great your blessings and merits are, they will eventually be exhausted, as blessings and merits are impermanent. Renunciation is also impermanent. No matter how well you cultivate renunciation, if you haven't attained liberation and enlightenment, after a kalpa without a Buddha appearing, your renunciation will completely decline. That's why it's hard for sentient beings to attain Buddhahood. It's easy to decline. Why should we go to the Pure Land? Because once you are reborn there, you won't decline. In the Saha world, after reincarnation, it's easy for our practice to decline and hard to keep going. If we don't encounter the Dharma, we will decline. After your renunciation arises, you should strike while the iron is hot. Even if you haven't attained the first stage of enlightenment in this lifetime, once you reach the forbearance stage or peak stage, you are unlikely to decline. In your next life, upon encountering the authentic Dharma, you will immediately engage in Dharma practice. As long as the Dharma is available in the world, you will surely encounter it. Moreover, you won't be influenced or misled by false teachings. When there is no Buddha appearing in the world, we must generate Buddha Chitta and aspire to be reborn in the Pure Land. Some people's renunciation is as fragile as a dewdrop and easily evaporates. When I give Dharma teachings, you may arouse renunciation, but once you return home, you may forget it. When you comfortably stay with your children and spouse, you may forget what renunciation is. As for the next life, it's even harder to say. Who knows where you might fall? Therefore, please remember... When you have just generated a bit of renunciation, you must grasp it tightly and not let it fade away. The seed and sprout of renunciation are easily spoiled. So, what is the boundary between having renunciation and not having renunciation? Lama Tsongkhapa, in the Three Principal Aspects of the Path, said, if one constantly seeks liberation day and night without interruption, this kind of renunciation is considered firm. This standard is quite high. It represents an excellent renunciation which can be scored 80, 90 or even 100. However, as ordinary beings, it's impossible for us to achieve this at the beginning of our practice. We need to first cultivate a qualified renunciation, reaching a score of 60, which is the passing score. This goal is very important. So, what is the standard for a qualified renunciation? 
Those without renunciation only seek worldly happiness in this life and next lives. Apart from that, they are content with their current situation and simply go with the flow, without any higher aspirations. On the other hand, those with renunciation may occasionally have such thoughts. They might also enjoy good food, clothing and housing. However, deep in their heart, there is always an unwavering belief. These are not the purpose of life, but just temporary ways of living. They don't really care about these things and see them as optional. If they are available, they may enjoy them. If not, they are not bothered. Deep in their hearts, their ultimate goal is liberation. If your aspiration to attain liberation is like this, growing rather than declining, then you can basically be considered to have a qualified renunciation. With all that said, in summary, no matter which school of Buddhism you study, you should first cultivate renunciation.